term white collar crime was coined in 1939 by Edwin Sutherland, who defined it as a crime committed by a person of respectability and high social status in the course of his occupation, in a speech titled The White Collar Criminal, delivered to the American Sociological Society. Sutherland hypothesized that white collar criminals had different attributions and motives than typical street criminals. His theory was the result of his attempt to study two fields, crime and high society, which had previously lacked empirical correlation. His goal was to demonstrate the correlation between money and social status and the likelihood of going to jail for white collar crime. Although the percentage has risen, numbers still show a large majority of those in jail are poor, blue-collar criminals. Many attribute the social climate following the Great Depression as the factor that led to Sutherland's theory. He noted that in his time, less than 2% of the persons committed to prisons in a year belong to the upper class. Yes, I think higher class people uh, definitely have an easier time getting away with crime than lower class people because they can afford to, uh, to defend themselves. Yeah, I think that's definitely true because they have the resources to hire the better lawyers. They don't get the public defenders. They can hire high priority lawyers who know how to work the system and get them off. So I definitely think they have an easier time. Criminologist Simon Connor says much of Sutherland's work focused on the difference between blue collar crime and white collar crime. Well, the United States passed something called antitrust laws in the 1920s and then passed social welfare laws in the 1930s during the Great Depression. This is when people went to great lengths to really rebuild their financial security and a, lo a lot of experts theorize that this led workers who worked hard and long and felt underpaid to be taken advantage of. Uh, much of Sutherland's work was to separate and define the differences really of, of blue collar street crimes. Precisely because these criminals were held to such high esteem, Sutherland claimed that society turned a blind eye to the crimes they committed. According to investigative journalist Danny Schechter, the term white collar may be relatively new. However, these kinds of fraud go back in our history. And at that point, the financial services industry basically uh, developed a modern lobbying army, 28 lobbyists for every member of Congress, 28 to 1, who found ways to why this won't work and that has to change and that's uh, illegal or whatnot. So they began to hack away at the rules before, the, at, at the law before they could create rules to enforce it. See, it's a process. First, you have hearings about the problem. Then you come up with a bill. Then the bill gets watered down and finally signed into law. Then they have to decide how to enforce the law and come up with rules and regulations. And that's where uh, the lobbying, uh, the lobbyists for the financial in the industries and the banks went to work. And a lot of the people they hired were former members of Congress uh, who represented them, who know the ins and outs of financial and congressional manipulation. He adds that the crash of Wall Street in the late 1920s had much to do with fraud, and we saw a similar trend recently with a financial crisis, almost like history repeating itself. The people who have studied the Wall Street crash, 1929, particularly uh, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith, who's written about the great crash, says that a lot of it had to do with fraud. Uh, and, you know, hustling, uh, you know, various stock uh, maneuvers uh, that were illegal and deceptive. And so, you know, this was part of the reason that the markets crashed. You would think because of this history, somebody would remember this because historians have written about it. You'd think uh, that there would be journalists who would point this out, the similarities, the parallels between what's happening today and what happened then. But by and large, they haven't. You know, that's sort of a kind of amnesia when it comes to crime in high places. And since there is less immediate policing oversight for these white-collar criminals, the numbers have risen over the years. What were once considered criminal uh, practices were then sort of legalized as regulations, uh, 
you know, were, were taken off the books. And so things we used to think of as illegal became sort of legal or operated in a shadowy gray area where the people um, could manipulate, uh, you know, all these financial mechanisms, things that we never heard about back in the old days, like derivatives and whatnot. And these things were often so complicated that the regulators themselves didn't understand them. And so there was a loosening of not only uh, financial standards, but ethical standards as well. And if you could get away with it, then it was considered legitimate. Uh, and that's what we've seen all this time. I don't think the government did enough to punish them because they were so intertwined with the government because their success also helped the government grow. So it was just kind of like they were hurting themselves. So I'm not sure they were really punished. It just got so obvious and the economy took such a downturn that they had to punish them. Otherwise, they may have just swept a lot of it under the rug, I think. But I would assume they're not doing near enough to take care of the problem. They're just, they're trying to ignore it and just hope it gets better on its own. According to author and filmmaker Rory O'Connor, it's inevitable that we will face another financial crisis. Well, you know, there's this myth that we have on this stable financial system, internationally speaking, and it's exactly that. It's a myth, and if you look over the last hundred years, let's say, on average, there's a financial crisis about every six or seven years. So, in fact, what the reality is is that this very dangerous instability is actually built into the bedrock, into the structure of the entire financial system, and that has yet to change. So, it's in almost inevitable that we're going to be essentially back where we were at some point in the future. Definitely. I think, you know, because they've gotten away with it for so long in the past that they believe they'll continue to get away with it. And, uh, you know, there just there needs to be more checks in that system. I think white collar crime has been on the rise because profits are lower in most big companies and they're trying to find a way to make money, whether they, they used to make it, you know, legitimately and now their profits are way down from what they used to be. So they're going to find ways to make that money. Their lifestyle was high. They want to continue that lifestyle, so they're going to find a way to get the money. The filing of civil fraud charges by the SEC against former executives at Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac probably signals the end of cases arising from the financial crisis rather than a start to more actions aiming at leaders of Wall Street forums. So for years, white-collar criminals routinely received a slap on the wrist, sentences of probation, or at worst, a prison term measured in months, not years. Schecter notes they eroded people's faith in the financial system. After all, when people fear that they're investing in a scam, they're a whole lot less likely to invest at all. That will no doubt have an effect on our economy. In the wake of corporate scandals at Enron, WorldCom, Tyco, and Global Crossing, there's little doubt that serious corporate crime warranted serious sentences that could deter future fraud of that magnitude. Now, a few years ago, when people warned uh, of these practices and said these crimes were taking place, nobody investigated. The tendency of the government was to try to reach some sort of a deal uh, and get them, get the banks and the people engaging in these practices to pay fines, to have settlements uh, instead of prosecutions because prosecutions cost money and many of the people who are prosecutors come out of that world. They have conflicts of interest or ideological preferences supporting the bankers. The consequence is there's been no real vigilant uh, prosecution of financial crime on Wall Street. O'Connor adds that when these crimes are overlooked, not only will it set an example for the society, but often for top executives at big companies. Well, not only for the population, but I would say more importantly for the executives, okay? Because they're not stupid people. So let's say you're the executive of a leading bank and you or people working underneath you had been involved in, as we now see, uh, fixing the uh, lending rates between banks laundering drug money and terrorist money, <laughs> uh, packaging uh, fra uh, totally fraudulently billions, hundreds of billions of dollars of uh, mortg bad mo mortgages and putting them into quote unquote good securities. And I could go on and on and on. 
So these people are engaged in, I would say, a wide uh, breadth of criminal activity, you know, fraud, money laundering, fixing interest rates, uh, I, you know, it could go on and on. So, and, and if there is no criminal prosecution, then ultimately it becomes a business decision. You know, should I break the law? And if I do, will I get more money than I'll have to pay if I get caught? And the answer so far has been yes. So to my mind, that if it doesn't encourage further criminal behavior, it certainly isn't doing anything to inhibit it. The Justice Department and the SEC for their part say they have been fierce in their prosecution of white-collar crimes. I hardly think fierce is the appropriate adjective to use in this context, so I would completely disagree with that. That being said, there has been finally, at long last, years after the financial crisis, of course, uh, there has been some movement, perhaps some significant movement. There is a new uh, state federal task force that's looking at this here in New York. Uh, the state attorney general, Eric Schneiderman, has been very active with that. Uh, he's uh, undertaken some major investigations. Uh, but I don't think fierce is the right word for a number of reasons, but primarily because there really haven't been criminal prosecutions. And these are crimes that we're talking about, so I would not describe that as a fierce prosecution. The types of crime committed are a function of what is available to the potential offender. So those employed in relatively unskilled environments and living in inner city areas have fewer situations to exploit than those who work in situations where large financial transactions occur and live in areas where there's relative prosperity. It is estimated that a great deal of white-collar crime is undetected, or if detected, is not reported. One common misconception about corporate crime is that its effects are mainly financial. According to Schechter, the treatment of white-collar criminals, as compared to those convicted of, quote, street crimes, such as drug offenders, is a telling statement on the social inequality in the country. For example, cocaine. If you take powdered cocaine, uh, you get a certain uh, dispensation. If you take, uh, you know, a crack cocaine, you're given a, a, a higher sentence. So the law tends to prosecute uh, people who are lower class or working class people much more than upper class people. Upper class people can afford good lawyers and they manage to get around or evade the law that way or get, you know, softer sentences. So we're in a situation of inequities in the whole legal system that works to the advantage uh, of people in power and the 1%, if you will, uh, than the people who are poor and struggling or, or commit crimes in order to survive. Criminals should be treated equally, but unfortunately in the, in the real world, uh, the poor people don't have the assets to, to hire a good lawyer. They have to take what they can get, and, and sometimes they try to defend themselves or they get the public defender who has limited experience, limited education, so it's never going to be equal. I think crime should be treated equally as uh, as severe as um, as the you know infringement is. I think that you know if something's a felony, it should be treated the same no matter what type of felony it is. And so, what real effect has white collar crime had in the overall economy and financial institutions? If you argue, as I did in my book, the crime of our time, and my film Plunder, that this whole financial collapse uh, it was brought about uh, by illegal activities and by white collar scheming uh, and people spending large sums of money to kind of change the legal structure uh, through lobbyists, through financial donations to candidates, that the whole thing is, is uh, if you will, a Ponzi scheme, a criminal enterprise, uh, then all of the money that's been lost is really attributable to that. We're talking trillions of dollars. You know, I've just come from South Africa where corruption is a big problem, but the corruption there is, is uh, you know, kind of bits, you know, is minor compared to what we have here. And the fact is that here, uh, there's very little effort to try to bring these people to justice. And how about ordinary Americans? I ask O'Connor particularly about the middle class. We've all been affected by this, you know, the, the middle class and, and the poor people. It's, let's not forget them. You know, everyone likes to talk about middle class, middle class, middle class in the United States. And, and that's all we heard during the, the recent presidential election. But poor people, obviously, are being impacted even 
more, but you know, basically the 98% of us, you know, who aren't at the top echelon have suffered in terms of your question about the middle class, you know, overall middle class uh, uh, gross values and, and net worth have plummeted over the last decade, not entirely, but largely as a result of these actions by these uh, banksters, as we call them, you know, who've engaged in this illegal conduct and really not been punished for it. So we've all uh, lost money. Uh, the employment rate is still at, you know, all-time high. I mean, none of this is, is news, okay? So the entire uh, country and, in fact, the in really the entire world has been impacted by this in a negative way and continues to be. Uh, but just finally, I think that what it does is it makes people feel like uh, the fix is in, okay? Because we all know now what these banksters were doing, what they are doing. We know that if they get caught, and they don't often get caught, but if and when they get caught, they don't normally even face criminal prosecution. And we know that uh, the actual the marketplace, the so-called free marketplace, is not free at all. In fact, in fact, it's fixed. So the ripple from that, I mean, let's say I'm thinking of investing in some stocks. Well, honestly, I'd be a fool to do that now. Primarily because of insider trading that surfaced in recent months. Insider trading is the trading of a corporation's stock or other securities such as bonds or stock options by individuals with access to non-public information about the company. Insider trading is the very embodiment of the fixed system in a so-called free marketplace, okay? And there are, there are reasons why there are laws against using this so-called inside information when you go out and, and, and trade. And the, re the basic reason is because you, the general population is not privy to that. So we don't have a level playing field. We have some people who know what's going on and other people who are out there making investment decisions essentially by throwing darts with a blindfold on. Some believe the government has been getting tough on insider trading cases. In the latest case, which recently made headlines, involved the conviction of Anthony Chasen and Todd Newman in a lucrative insider trading case. The potential sentences of more than 10 years in prison that the two defendants face will be appealed, so their fate is yet to be determined. The case was a classic insider trading prosecution built on the testimony of analysts at their hedge funds who had confessed to receiving confidential information about Dell and Nvidia and then passing it on. It boils down to the fundamental problem in the, uh, in the economy, not only in the national economy but the international economy, that these large financial entities, the, the banks of America, the HSBC, the Credit Suisse, etc., are literally still too big to fail. So we saw recently, for example, with HSBC, you know, they were engaged in the despicable and obviously criminal conduct. And this wasn't just taking just, but it wasn't just financial fraud. It was actively laundering money for, for example, the Mexican drug mafia and cartel. So if that isn't criminal behavior, I don't know what it is, but the decision was made uh, to go for a very large a civil settlement of billions of dollars and not to initiate any uh, criminal prosecution. And the reason for that is that it was feared that this bank was so large that if they charged them for their criminal activities, it might not only have a terrible effect on the bank, but it might spread as we saw in 2008 and infect all over again the entire financial situation. So what we see actually is that in terms of the structure, very little has changed and in fact we're set up for the, pretty much the same thing to happen all over again. Schechter brings up another case that has received less attention involving a bank in California. Recently uh, there's been a lawsuit connected with the Indy uh, Mac Bank in California, which uh, engaged routinely in the practice of these subprime, subcrime mortgages. And this most latest uh, verdict by the courts is that the executives of that bank are to be held financially responsible for ripping off all these people. And that's, you know, hundreds of millions of dollars. But still, there's no criminal 
sanctions. There's no prosecution. Part of the problem is it's harder to prove criminal uh, intent. And that's what a lot of these laws turn on. They've changed the actual laws. So it's not simply the effect of what you did, but did you intend to do it or not? Many of these people said, of course we didn't intend to do it. All we were trying to do was give families who can never afford nice homes to get into nice homes. That's not, can't be criminal. We, we, we did this all for the right reasons. And so they managed to wriggle around the law and its consequences very effectively. Uh, and that, that's a whole standard of prosecution. And then there is the loophole called RICO laws. RICO laws are racketeer oriented laws that have been used against the mafia. And they basically say, listen, if you worked with others to, to uh, uh, steal this money or to have this uh, social effect, then you are part of effectively a conspiracy. Now, most people in government, you know, when you talk about conspiracies, they dismiss it, ridiculous, 9-11, conspiracy, ridiculous, the Kennedy assassination, conspiracy, ridiculous, okay? They just dismiss all of this as paranoia of the highest level. But in their own laws, they have laws against conspiracies, and they take those laws very seriously, but they direct them against people they don't like, like the mafia, uh, you know, criminal syndicates, as opposed to financial syndicates, like the people on Wall Street, who also work together with others and come up with ways to fix prices or you know, or to engage in illegal practices. Today, the Dodd-Frank Wall Street Reform and Consumer Protection Act seeks to make government spending more transparent as well as make financial markets more sustainable. Still debate remains on its success as big banks seem to find new ways around regulations and the country's economy shows little sign of growth. The Dodd-Frank financial package of reforms is a great example of the problem. We had a financial collapse. Everybody admitted it. So uh, the Congress, in its wisdom, passed this comprehensive omnibus bill. Preet Bahara, U.S. Attorney for the Southern District of New York, recently wrote in an article that what might be most astonishing and disappointing is that some of the most outrageous security frauds have occurred at institutions with seemingly robust compliance programs, at least on paper. He concluded, financial fraud has been around forever. My office, which sits only steps from Wall Street, has been prosecuting white-collar crime since its foundation more than 220 years ago. And we are busier than ever. There's a lot of pressure on these guys to perform, to, to bring up the returns, to make more money, to compete against other banks. It's a culture uh, of, of uh, extremely aggressive uh, people who are fighting each other uh, with tools of mathematics and science to battle away. And, you know, so you have people like what they call the London Whale, a J.P. Morgan Chase, who took a bet and he lost $8 billion for the bank. Okay, $8 billion. And they say, well, we'll make it back, you know, was, was Chase's response. So you have a culture uh, that uh, permits all of these devious practices and the losers... The losers are the American people and the people of the world because the, these American institutions are global institutions. They're involved deeply all over uh, you know, the world. And it's not just the banks, but it's trade policies. It's uh, you know, the World Trade Organization, the World Bank, the IMF. All of them you know, are there to basically preserve the status quo, which means that big power and big money rules.